my string. I like it. Step one, step two. There we go. That's the that's the big sound. That's our our cue to go. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we are so excited to celebrate Doug Peacock's new memoir, Was It Worth It? Alongside fellow explorers, inquirers, uh, Todd Wilkinson and David Quammen. I'm your host, Jessica, here at the Country Bookshelf on the ancestral unceded land of the Upsaliki Crow, Kootenai, Bitterroot Salish, Cheyenne, Shoshone Bannock, Ochedi Shakoan, Kalispell Ponderé, South Bikani Blackfeet, Northern Cheyenne, Chippewa Cree, Assiniboine, Aani Gravant, and Dakota peoples, among many others. We encourage those of you joining us from outside Montana to learn more about the story, the land that you occupy and the stories of its peoples. Be sure to check in um, at countrybookshelf.com. You can follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on all the great bookish happenings that are happening here at Country Bookshelf. Before we begin tonight, I do wanna point out a few things about our virtual space. Uh, if you haven't added a copy of Was It Worth It to your registration, um, you can still purchase that from Country Bookshelf. Uh, we'll be dropping links in the, in the chat as time goes by. Um, so that'll reappear periodically. Uh, just click through. You'll probably also find more books by Doug as well as uh, by our other panelists tonight, David and Todd. Um, we are live streaming tonight and the event is being recorded so you can find it later um, on Country Bookshelf YouTube channel. Um, so just check that out and uh, we'll, sorry, I just, as I see the question go by, uh, books will be shipped uh, tomorrow, technically. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get those out for you as soon as we can. Um, if you run into any tech questions along the way, I do recommend exiting and re-entering the webinar that will usually clear any problems. Um, if that doesn't work, just head over to the Country Bookshelf YouTube channel and you can watch there and hopefully you won't, those sound issues and things will get fixed. Um, I do want to remind everyone that this is a shared creative space that we want to remain welcoming to everyone who has joined us today, offensive or inappropriate comments or questions, we'll see the user dismissed. Now for the good part. <laughs> Doug Peacock is an American naturalist, outdoorsman and author. He is best known for his book, Grizzly Years, In Search of the American Wilderness, a memoir of his experiences in the 70s and 80s, much of which he spent alone in the wilderness of the Western US observing grizzly bears. He co-founded Save the Yellowstone Grizzly, Wildlife Damage Review, Vital Ground, and the Round River Conservation Studies. Um, just in case you, you thought that you had accomplished everything, uh, Doug's still a little bit further ahead of you. <laughs> he serves as chairman of the board of directors for Round River, which works with indigenous people and governments in Namibia, Botswana, North, South, and Central America, to develop conservation strategies, protecting and enhancing intact ecosystems. Round River has emerged as one of the most successful medium-sized con conservation groups anywhere, having contributed to the preservation of more than 20 million acres of wilderness. Doug lives in emigrant Montana and spends a considerable time in the Sonoran Desert, I believe where he's coming to us from tonight, uh, as well as Southeastern Utah and with the grizzlies of Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks. Todd Wilkinson is also with us tonight. He is an author, journalist, and founder of Mount Mountain Journal. His work has appeared in a wide variety of national publications, ranging from National Geographic and Christian Science Monitor to the Washington Post and many others. His books include the critically acclaimed Science Under Siege, Last Stand, and Grizzlies of Pilgrim Creek. Uh, David Quammen is an author and journalist whose books include The Song of the Dodo, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, and Spillover, and The Tangled Tree. In the past 30 years, David has also published a few hundred pieces of short nonfiction, feature articles, and essays in magazines such as Harper's, National Geographic, Outside, Esquire, The Atlantic, Powder, Rolling Stone, The New York Times, and The New York Times Book Review. So with all of those accolades, 
available. Um, I'm going to disappear. Uh, please feel free to leave any questions for our authors uh, by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It does look like some folks have already found that. Uh, we will get to those as time allows. You can leave those questions at any time, but I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Gentlemen, take us away. Well, thank you, Jessica. It's uh, great to catch a glimpse of Montana again. I am indulgently down in the lower Sonoran Desert um, in cactus country, and, but I'll be back by April. So, you know, I, I, I know a cold spell just came through. I hope we got a little sticking snow, but uh, thanks to Todd and David for uh, coming, coming out and helping me with this, uh, this uh, ordeal. You know, we'll see. Yeah, I know these guys will keep me honest. You know, I, 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 I could uh, descend into BS for most of my uh, talks, but they, they will keep me honest. I assure you. <laughs> it's been beautifully chilly here. Oh, know. that's just the... <laughs> just barely crisp the last few days. Just barely crisp. And and people know Todd and I are here because we venerate this man and because he's our pal. So we see him in perspective and we see him with great positive bias and you'll get a mix of that tonight. Um, Todd is, uh, and Doug have um, allowed me to ask the first question tonight. And we don't, we don't know where we're going. This is, you know, this is friends and con conversation and and you'll all be in conversation with us before the end of this i hope too but doug okay so this new book which has got so much in it a lifetime of travels in wild places and memories and stories about wild places some of which are ring bells with me some of which are very familiar to me some of which are new to me but this book is dedicated to Olivia Peacock, Lina Weaver. That, that's the uh, small woman that gave me my cold. <laughs> Please tell us who she is and why this book is oh, dedicated to she's her. She's my granddaughter, my only grandchild. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I wasn't sure I was going to hang around long enough to have that experience, but it's uh, the center of my life right now. How old is Olivia? She is three years old. Three and big she ones. Talks, huh? She talks in paragraphs, David. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is she is she the daughter of the person to whom <clears throat> we used to refer to as Baby Laurel? Baby Laurel or Dee Dee. That's it. That's Laurel's daughter, Olivia. I apologize, Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> Laurel and Stephen. Yeah. So, so what does it mean to you to take... 55 or 60 years worth of wild landscape and wild creature travels and observations and and hand that to Olivia. Well, it means a couple things uh, in particular. First of all, I'm going to try to hang around long enough to introduce her to some of those places that experience the animals and, uh, you know, and uh, her hands are going to be full. I mean, just, uh, you know, we, we have everything I, I talk about in the book threatening us. And uh, here's somebody, you know, we have a rumor of war in the last 48 hours and it's, uh, it's terrifying, you know. More than a rumor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I want, You know, I want to devote the rest of my life to just uh, doing what I can to hang on to the planet because so uh, we're we're backed into a corner here, and you know I, I I'll continue to fight for grizzly bears, but I realize the grizzly bears are you know in the same boat as we are, and uh, you know it's going to take all our talents to bail us out of this, if at all. Doug? Yeah. Dougie, so um, David and I want you to get to some passages to read from the book, and we'll get to that after a while. 
But for the the younger folk tuning in tonight, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. We all start on the journey and we don't know where it's going to take us. So my question is, as a kid in Michigan, did you have any affinity or a conception of grizzly bears and what was it? Well, in Michigan, the black bear was king as it were, but I grew up with a love of wild places. My, my father was a professional boy scout organizer. You know, he organized troops and, and I, he took me up to uh, scout camp when I was too little to be a boy scout and just let me run loose in the woods. And you know, that, that was the, the life I grew up in. Uh, uh, Were you in the upper peninsula? Um, only I went up there, I took my first backpack trip up there at 16 or 17, solo backpack trip on the big two-hearted river. And I knew Hemingway hadn't fished it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I was in the northeastern part of, uh, of the lower peninsula and, you know, it was full of swamps and rivers. I grew up with my, gra at my grandfather's cabin, you know, trout fishing and picking mushrooms and it was just, uh, it was a great life. And I went down to the swamps. I hunted arrowheads when I was a little boy. And, uh, you know, at the end of this book, I rebury them all. Repatriating the arrowheads. Yeah, yeah that's a great section. Yeah, and a, and a great concept. I remember you and I in a very wild place once, finding arrowheads in the water. And you're saying, well, we need to leave these right here. <laughs> I'm not saying where that was. No. But they stayed there. Yeah, and they're very old arrowheads. Those people were probably hunting, uh, I, you know, it was after the time of the mammoth, but not much after. You know, it was re really an old uh, place in Yellowstone. And it's, uh, you know, the value of having that stuff on the land is, you know, it inspired me as a young um as a young teenager to think, think about the people that lived here thousands of years ago and how they lived and, uh, and, and just want, wanting to, you know, just striving to share just a, a wedge of their life. Yeah. So going back to what Todd just referenced, um, your youth in, in Michigan, your father was a Boy Scout organizer. I remember that. Do you remember, what's your, what's your earliest memory of closely observing the natural world? You know, I was a little boy, about five, and uh, it was a fall day at a, you know, at a hidden Boy Scout camp before the Boy Scouts got there. And it had a lake in the middle of it. And I remember stripping off all my clothes and running naked through the fall foliage of, uh, you know, Northern Lower Peninsula of Michigan. It was just, it was one of the most sensuous experiences of my life and about the first, you know, it was just a little boy, just, we would say back then plain Indian, but. What about, uh, what about creatures? What, what were the first creatures that? Well, we had, uh, you know, we had the usual animals, but going up to uh, Camp Rotary, um, in the middle of Michigan, uh, we had uh, black bear, black bear all over the place. And, uh, uh, and th there was a wild bison that got loose from some game farm. And, you know, he, he was like the legend of, uh, he was legendary in the woods. I found his sign a little bit. I was really scared. I didn't know quite what a bison was, but, uh, you know, he was, I'm glad he got free. <laughs> So you, you have this sensitive young man who ends up in Vietnam as a Green Beret medic. Yeah. And I don't know if you want to riff on that experience, but you come back and you end up finding yourself out West. How was that path going from Michigan to Vietnam to the West, how did that happen? 
Well, you know, I invited uh, Martin Luther King to speak at the University of Michigan by, by myself. You know, I raised money to pay him and picked him up at the airport. What year is this, Doug? 1962, David. And, uh, you know, so that's where my heart was. And, uh, you know, I was an anti-war guy. And still I let, I allowed the draft to pick, sweep me up, you know, many years later. And, uh, you know, I ended up uh, as, as that Greenberry medic. And to me, you know, um, it, it, it seems like a single trip. It was, I'm not surprised that took a turn. And it gave me, you know, war is uh, horrific and we're gonna welcome a lot of new vets into that arena apparently very very soon which is tragic yeah. and somebody is shaking a nuclear bomb over our heads and that is terrifying it's what I've been terrified of all my life I never thought something would outstrip the threat of the bomb but it has and that's our climate um, so we've got all this stuff but you know as a You know, I, I, I was in a war, in a real shooting war. And, uh, you know, I think that I was, uh, I, I was a little more surgical with my uh, engagement in that war because I was on my own the whole time. You know, the Green Berets are out in the middle of the Central Highlands, you know, in jungle habitat with mountain yards and such. You know, I didn't speak a word of Vietnamese all day, all day long, you know, until I came in to, at night and <laughs> grabbed a beer. And, uh, you know, that was an experience that allowed me to see myself in a war a little bit from the perspective of uh, minority peoples. And those are the mountain yards. Um, so I came back with a, you know, a full satchel full of baggage that I, at first uh, it was overpowering, you know, and uh, that was born, that was born, I think, um, you know, I, I say in the book, uh, I was a Green Beret who, uh, who witnessed a little too much collateral damage. And I call it that coward, cowardly phrase they apply to the pile of small dismembered bodies after a botched air attack. And, uh, you know, the, the, I saw the Tet Offensive in which, uh, you know, so many civilians were killed in a crossfire. It was just unspeakable. And I came back with that in my backpack, so to speak, and almost immediately took it into the wilderness with me. I started out down here and moved north in 1968 until I got into the Wind Rivers and had a malaria attack. And, uh, and you know, I had enough time. I, I've had a lot of malaria attacks, so I know how they unfold. And I decided I was gonna get the hell out of the Wind Rivers and go to Yellowstone where, yellow, uh, relatively speaking, it's better, the, the climate is much better than the east side of the Wind Rivers and it's almost flat in comparison. And, um, so I went in there in the middle of a hallucinogenic paroxysm and uh, my temperature spiked to 105.6. That's my last diary entry. And I don't know how long I was there, but um, so it's, you know, that's when I ran into grizzly bears and I thought I was dreaming them because I was in the middle of this uh, feverish malaria hallucinogenic trip but they turned out to be real bears. They're all over the place. And it's quite, you know, perplexing, magical, and it got my attention right from the start. Um, Tet, the Tet Offensive, 54 years ago, right now. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I remember that too. Uh, although I was, I was safe in New Haven, Connecticut. Relatively safe. Yeah, relatively safe. I started to feel less safe as yeah. I as I turned uh, twenty. And um, you mentioned the uh, the Montagnard people. Jessica mentioned 
of course, the Dakota people, the Salish right. Kootenai people. Let me, let me just be so bold as to say, let's take 10 seconds right now, all of us, and think about the people of Ukraine. So it's difficult. Um, what year did you go to Vietnam, Doug? Uh, I left in late 1966, and I was there until yeah. uh, spring of uh, 68. Yeah, and, and these peoples, all of these peoples fighting in various ways for their freedom. Um, so you come back in 68, you go to Glacier, you go to Yellowstone, you deal with your memories and your trauma by close observation of the bear, the big bear. And then for any of you who don't know about this, Doug published a book titled Grizzly Years. What year was that published, Doug? I wrote it in the late seventies. I don't think it got published till about a decade later. It, you know. <laughs> Who was the publisher? I forget. Well, first it was Simon and Schuster, and then it was Henry Holt. Simon and Schuster. Finally did it, you know. Okay, uh, Henry Holt. Grizzly years, people. Put it on your list. If you have not read this book, you must read this American nonfiction book, Grizzly Years by Doug Peacock, that talks about what we're talking about now. It's, it's the, it's more than the prequel to this book. Was it worth it? Um, it is, it is really an incredibly powerful, skillful, uh, fascinating, and moving book about a Green Beret medic who comes back from Vietnam and who works himself through PTSD by close observation of grizzly bears, becoming their respecting, intimate chronicler. And everything that Doug has done has flown, has flowed from that, um, including this book, which is filled with a further lifetime of observations of nature in the wild. Uh, you mentioned um, the big two-hearted river. Yeah. Um, Hemingway's great short story about coming back from World War I and going back to the Upper Peninsula and his, his, his prototype <clears throat> character, the character who stood in for himself, for the early Hemingway, Nick Adams, long before there was an actor who took the name Nick Adams, Hemingway owned the name Nick Adams, which stood in for young Ernest Hemingway. And Nick Adams goes back and he fishes the big two-hearted river in Upper Michigan, and he does not mention World War I, but it's all about PTSD. It's all about World War I. It's an incredibly skillful, resonant story. So one of your pieces, one of your chapters in this book is titled Headwaters. Yeah. It's right in the middle, and it's a special one for me among several, many special ones. Um, 1989, and we'll get back to Ed Abbey. Todd, remember, we have to go back and walk people through the whole Ed Abbey connection. We haven't even done that yet. But Ed Abbey, the great desert curmudgeon and writer, um, is your great pal, and... Um, and an important you and you and he are synergistically related in some of his most important work. And in eight, in 1989, Ed dies. Boom. Ed Abbey is dead. Age 62. Ed Abbey is dead. I'm in Guam doing research on a book. I get the news. Ed Abbey is dead. What? And then a number of the earth first people, Earth First, an organization that you had inspired or helped inspire, uh, 
<coughs> get um, penetrated by the FBI and charged with federal crimes, Dave Foreman, among others. And so 1989 is this hellacious time. I remember it. I can remember this. Um, Ed Abbey is dead. Dave Foreman is faced with federal charges. God knows where Peacock is. And they're rolling up the whole carpet of radical environmentalism in America. And they're going to try and finish it. And you go to Divide Montana on the big hole and you put a McKenzie boat in the water in June or July that year. July. July. And you fish your way, float your way, camp your way downriver on the big hole from Divide to Melrose to Glen to the Jefferson, past Maiden Rock, past the Beaverhead confluence, onto the Jefferson River, down to Three Forks. And then, in, and at the very end of that, you're, you're kind enough to mention me because you gave me a call and said, Mom, and come out here and pick me up, <laughs> which I did. Uh, that, that was presumptuous, but thank you, man, for the lift. Well, so here's... As I reread that today, that story of 60 <clears throat> days on the big hole and then the Jefferson, fishing and camping and being alone, nobody, no, nobody much is on those stretches of river um, and observing, observing the heron rookeries and observing everything else. Even before you mention it tonight, I'm thinking this is Doug's big two-hearted river because this is a story that goes on for 20 pages or so, and it mentions nothing but riffles and eddies and grayling and trout, but it has everything to do with the death of Ed Abbey and the rolling up of the radical environmental movement in America. So here's my question. Yeah. If, if you grant that premise that there is some connection there. To what extent, and, and, I, and I, heard, I heard echoes of Hemingway in your language, particularly, and not always in your language. Your language can be much more um, complicated and graceful and risky than Hemingway's language. And I'm not trying to blow smoke. Hemingway was a great, great writer. He was a phenomenon. But you, you are a wonderful prose compositor. But in this one in particular, I heard, I heard echoes of Ernest. So here's my question. Mm -hmm. Things like that. In, in what ways is Ernest Hemingway an inspiration? And in what ways is he a whirlpool that represents the danger of sucking one in? Yeah. Stylistically uh -huh. and in terms of perceptions, sensitivities, the, the male ethos and all that. Right. Well, I'm, I'm uh, on, on call to give the Hemingway keynote <laughs> to the Hemingway Society this uh, summer in Cook City. And so I've thought about that a lot. Uh, I've read everything, everything of Hemingway, everything. Uh, you know, most mostly as a teenager, and uh, you know, it, and Hemingway shared a lot of prose style with us. I didn't read Hemingway to to glean insights to his writing in particular, but uh, those are beautiful stories. And that big two-hearted river collection is, uh, you know, it's just among the best in any language. That's that's just fantastic stuff. Well, it's true. That was uh, a trip where, you know, things were in turmoil. My domestic life was uh, was in turmoil and uh, the first people had just been busted. And, and well, I, I was, you know, I, I'm too old to be an earth firster in a way and totally unimportant to that movement. But the FBI was at my doorstep the same day they busted Dave in, in Tucson. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, 
and having having uh, having buried Ed Abbey, you know, um, I had a lot to say goodbye to, and uh, and you know, and and Ed was an important enough person in my life and in all all our lives that uh, I really wanted to give his passing uh, an honoring, you know, and part of that is just to continue the importance of Ed Abbey because I think he is that important, you know, he's the one that told us only wilderness is worth saving, you know, it's something I've clung to all these decades. But uh, going in the big, you know, going on, I almost said big too hearted, but it was the, uh, it was the Big Hole River and the Jefferson was ex uh, exactly that. I, I, uh, I was able to externalize my own thinking to the point where I really paid a lot of attention to birds and insects and things like that. And, uh, you know, I tried fishing and but eventually the fishing got old and uh you know i quit fishing altogether by the end of the trip i'd become a total vegetarian i had a little whiskey with me and i poured it in the jefferson and you know went cold turkey and you know it, it, i quit eating uh, fish and crayfish even you know, just but that that was a indulgent trip again and uh, i didn't have much choice because no one was going to pick me up. If you hadn't got me, I might be in St. Louis by now, you know. <laughs> I had no way of getting off the river. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we don't get to do that very often, and we should, you know, uh, for good reasons, and and uh, we should really appreciate, you know, the act of that indulgence. You know, I've, I've done a lot in my life, and I realize that, you know, solitude is also, especially when you have children, is, is a considerable indulgence. So, you know, and yet it's the deepest well I know of for delving into what I think I need to think about. Doug, I want to I want to take this. Uh, David has set this up perfectly, and cycle back a little bit. Cycle back through '68. You're on the home front. You're in the West. You've had this series of kind of mystical experiences. I would imagine that in Vietnam, you had a few of those. You have malaria, you encounter grizzly bears. And at the same time, that period between 68 and 89, industrial logging is tearing across the West. We have all sorts of things going on. And then somehow, you run into Edward Abbey. Could you tell a few stories about how that occurred and the impact that he had on you and what the import of, of Abbey was, you think more broadly and also to you? Well, I met Ed uh, pretty early. It was, in, it was in the winter of 1968. And uh, once the grizzly bears hibernated, uh, as I am now, I would I would hightail it down to the low desert. You know, I've had this dual love of grizzly bear country and you know the lower snoring desert all my life, and I, I, I just can't hardly bear to go a year without visiting either one of them. And I've been lucky to be able to have done that. Um, <coughs> excuse me, David. Andrea mixed me a Quaman drink. <laughs> oh no, Andrea, you're a <laughs> you're a dangerous influence. <laughs> yeah. Okay, man. Okay. Um, the, um, back up a bit and prime me again a little bit on this question. Abby, sixty-eight. Oh, yeah, sixty-eight. That's right. Okay. Um, so I was a uh, not quite a hippie mailman, but I was a mailman substitute mailman down in Tucson. I lived out in the desert and I came down there to uh, my junior medic in Vietnam. His father was Edward H. Spicer, an eminent anthropologist, a wonderful man, uh, author of uh, uh, what? Cycles of Conquest. 
Uh, that cycles of conquest. That uh, it was a wonderful book on the on the conquest, so to speak, of the Southwest indigenous tribes. Um, and so I, I lived in his house, and the people around me introduced me to people like Alan Harrington, who was a, a writer, and uh, he introduced me to Bill Eastlake. Bill and I got to be really good friends, and and you know I, I'd still. Bill wrote incredible books. Castle Keep. He wrote the first book about Vietnam, a fictional Bamboo, book. Bamboo Bed. Bamboo Bed. You know, when the war was still going on, that was seventy-two. And uh, anyway, Bill called me up and said, "Doug, why don't you come over? I'm having some people over tonight. There's somebody I want you to meet." And Bill lived at the foot of David knows the country, but at the foot of the Mount Lemmon Highway. But back in 68, it was nothing, you know, just dirt roads and very, you know, the, none, none of the industrial uh, townhouse plop was there than just an occasional house. And so I had a motorcycle and it was winter time. And, and uh, you know, and so I drove up and down these dirt roads. I kind of knew what area Bill lived in, but I wasn't, you know, exact on how to get there. I drove around for probably half hour. Uh, till I found a house and I kind of, you know, before you go in a, a house at night, you want to kind of, you know, not go in the wrong house at night, you know. <laughs> so I checked it out and uh, decided you know, this was the place. And uh, so I went inside and there were a bunch of people sitting around and uh, writer types, I <laughs> say, you know, uh, but uh, uh, the, the guy that sat next to me had a dark uh, black beard and he's, he sat next on a couch and uh, I was cold. It's wintertime and driving this motorcycle lost in, in the desert and it's cold at night. And so, you know, I, uh, I, I smoked uh, bugler cigarettes at the time, which I, you know, hand rolled. So I tried to roll myself a little joint like cigarette from bugler and I had matches, but I was Pulsy, and I couldn't light the match. And this guy reached over, gave me a light, <laughs> and that was Edward Abbey. We talked about mountain lions that uh, night. I think he's just published that Life magazine article on lions. And he invited me to come out to visit him in Organ Pipe, where I am pretty much right now. And uh, he was a seasonal ranger because, as we know, working seasonal for the uh, Park Service gives you gives you a quitting date to look forward to. As Ed first recommended me to apply for a job. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, and he showed up those days, he showed up with a, a six pack of beer and a bottle of whiskey and you knocked on a door and, you know. Uh, so this is, this is 1968? Yeah. So, you know, 69, it was right over the winter time. I, I don't so remember. Had, had Desert Solitaire just been published? No, it was out because I had read it. So I knew this. You had read it. So when you met this guy, you said, oh, you're the desert solitaire guy. No, I didn't. I, I wasn't impressed with writers back then. <laughs> you know, a lot of my friends have turned out to be writers, but I think that's a logical consequence of good, decent people, too. You so know? to segue from that. Yeah. <laughs> when did you formulate the thought, well, hell, I can do this. I can be a writer. I can tell stories you know, that have at least this much power and I can tell them just as well. When did that? You know, David, it just, I never thought of myself as a writer. It was just an all an accident. You know, I, I had baby Laurel about that time and she needed new shoes and I had to make some money on working as a fire lookout for four grand a year or whatever. What was and the I, very I, first thing that you published? Yeah. And, you know, I wrote it. They didn't get run publishing for a decade, but nonetheless, I wrote what it as a fire lookout. What, what was it? Was it about being a fire lookout? No, it was about immersing yourself in the wilderness of Grizzly Country. You know, Grizzly. So the book, Grizzly Years, was the very first thing of any sort that you published? Yeah. Wow. Okay. I, 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 I just banged it out on my dad. Yeah, okay. Typewriter. I, I had, I, maybe I knew that, but I had forgotten that. Yeah, no, uh, I never had a, you know, you know, I've, 
I don't want to talk about being a writer because I've never thought of myself. It's just an accident, but it's a good way. It's a very good life, you guys. So, you know, it, we're able to get our thoughts and messages out to a lot of it's people. A, it's a gravy train. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of easy now, but, uh, you know, I've never sat down in the morning with a blank piece of paper. You know, I, I, I'm kind of, I wait until I have something. I want to share with people and then I type it out and it goes really fast, you know, because of past experience and uh, uh, most of it is anyway. And who reads it first? Me. And then? Well, Andrea reads, reads my books. Before, well, before it goes into the mail, oh, before, it, before you, you hit send? Jim Harrison looked at it. Ed, Ed looked at it. This is with grizzly ears? Yeah, mm -hmm. both yeah. of them. Hey, David, uh, one thing I want to do here is uh, glance over at Andrea and let's see her face. Good idea. Andrea doesn't. Come on. No? Come on, Andrea. Come on, Andrea. No, no. There's the, there's the dog. There's a dog. There's Andrea somewhere. There's Andrea in the corner. Tilt it up a little bit. Okay, Andrea. Andrea, <laughs> listen, relax. <laughs> relax, God damn it. Relax, oh. God damn it. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to put a plug in here yeah. for Andrea, who is also a writer, a fine journalist. Yes, yes. And wrote a very great piece, one of the first early exposés on the contamination of asbestos with the people of Libby. And so you, the person who's writing and reviewing your words is someone who's very skilled and insightful herself. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> He's blo she's blowing a kiss to you, Todd. <laughs> you know, um... Robert Penn Warren once told me, and I didn't know how true it was, that it's not bad to have a wife who is also an author. Yeah, no, well, you 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 landed you landed one. I landed okay, okay, Betsy. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I want Doug to read something. I want okay. I want I want a sample of this the texture of this book to go into the ears of of people here uh and so i picked out a spot if i can find it what's it about it's about when you're cooking oh yeah so it's 1989 folks ed abby has died we could ask doug how ed died and whether ed had to die at the age of 62 if there's anybody tuned in who doesn't know who Ed Abbey is, then uh, I don't know if we can back up that far. Um, but uh, so Ed Abbey has died and there is a wake for him that is going to happen in the Sonoran Desert. Okay, Doug, you got your book? I got it. All right. And uh, huh, Ed is only 62. He is the icon of conservation, of, of radical, um, daring conservation action in the Western U.S. Um, of, of he, he and Doug essentially inspired the Earth First organization that then was concretized by Dave Foreman and Howie Wolke and, and uh, Mike Rizal and some other heroic figures, Phil Knight, who I think is with us this evening, et cetera. And uh, so Ed is dead and there is a memorial coming for him in the Sonoran Desert outside of Tucson. And hundreds of people are gonna be there. And Ed has left behind instructions of what he wants his dear friend and executor informal executor peacock to do you know i want 
I want bagpipes. I want happy people. I want music. I want food. I want beer. I want booze. I want lovemaking. I want people to be smiling at my wake. And Doug goes into certain areas of the Southwest and he finds a hundred pounds of fresh meat. And I won't, it's in the book. Uh, yeah, slow out. Book, man. He acquires, he, 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 he acquires through certain activities, a hundred pounds of good slow elk. We, we picked it very carefully. Yes. It's from, and, then, from, and then he takes it back to his home in Tucson and he knows that he's cooking for like a hundred people or 200 people for Ed Abbey's wake. <laughs> Doug, have you got your book? Yeah, I got it. And, you know, by then I wasn't cooking for the people. I was just, you know, I, I didn't think anybody would be really interested in exquisite food. Yeah, uh, it was an honoring you, for Abby. You were you were going through you were going through a morning ritual as well as cooking. Yeah. So start at the bottom of page one oh nine, where it says, "I let my mind go." Yeah. Okay. And yeah. read one page, and about a half. Yeah. Oh, I got until it. You get to the point of, um, the the end of the paragraph on page one twelve, and let them yeah. let them hear right. that. So I'm in my backyard, uh, two, two entire days cooking sheep herder stew, elegant style, and beef jerky as requested by Ed in his funeral uh, notes. I had, <clears throat> I had held it together throughout the weeks of Ed's last illness, his death and burial. You know, I, I was with Ed when he died and I, yeah. I buried him a couple of days later. It had been all business and there had been no time for grief. Uh, and I've been sharpening my knives in previous uh, paragraphs, so here. But now, however, remembering the collie and the can of Elpo, because I, I had nicked my knife. <coughs> Excuse me, man. <coughs> A shudder ran up my spine and I began to shake and sob. <coughs> Sorry, man. I looked around the yard to see if anyone was about. Done with the knives, I went inside and splashed water in my face. This was not seemly behavior for a wake. I brought in the frosted milk from the freezer, laid it on the chopping block, and put Bruckner's Symphony Number no. Four, the Romantic, on, which I didn't get to play much because Lisa, my wife, couldn't stand it. Nearly everybody I knew disliked this composer, except Ed and me. The, the music billowed and strained. I sliced the tenderloin with the grain, cut it into long strips about an inch in diameter, and repeated the process with big hunks of top sirloin, setting aside a half dozen pounds of strips for jerky. I worked slowly, enjoying the repetitive movements, cubing and slicing, cutting the meat with a simple pleasure. Bruckner finished with a flourish and I replaced him with Sibelius, another romantic composer Ed was fond of. I diced five pounds of mesquite bacon and dumped it into rapidly boiling water in the uh, cast iron Dutch oven that the Abbeys had given me as a wedding gift. After 10 minutes, I poured the contents into a colander, scrubbed the pot, and then returned to parboiled bacon along with several big dollops of olive oil. Despite Ed's affection for Sibelius, I interrupted his finalia for a Mozart violin and a viola concerto. I turned up the heat under the Dutch oven until the mixture of bacon grease and olive oil began to smoke a bit. I dropped the cubes of beef into the hot oil and seared them on all sides. As the meat browned, I lifted out the cubes with a slotted spoon. I had inadvertently liberated from Huckab Berry Lookout in Glacier National Park, where Ed and I had both worked at Fire Lookouts during the 70s. I added more cubes of beef, a dozen or so at a time, with over, over 50 pounds of meat. This took a while. When all the meat was seared, I browned two bunches of carrots and a couple hundred small white onions in what was left of the same batch of oil. When I was finished with the vegetables, I tossed out the oil. Now I had a mountain of meat, which I divided among four big D casserole dishes. 
I popped the cork on one of my best bottles. Hey, David, am I reading the right part? Yeah, keep going for my okay, small okay. but adequate. Yeah, yeah, I want you to get to the point of I let my mind go. Maybe jump ahead to I let two, two paragraphs down. I let my mind go. Yeah, man. Okay. See what I mean? Or just keep going or just keep going. Let me just keep going. because Yeah, just keep going. I popped the cork on one of my best bottles from my small but adequate stash of Bordeaux. Bordeaux. I'm a poor man, but a Bordeaux freak. A, a, a 1970 Lafort Latour. Yeah. When, when all the meat was seared, I browned two bunches of carrots and a couple hundred small white onions in what was left of the oil. When I finished with the vegetables, I tossed out the oil. I popped the cork on one of my best bottles from my small but adequate stash of Bordeaux. A 1970 Fort uh, Le Fort La, de la Tour. Uh, poured a full glass for the cook and put on a Beethoven string quartet, Opus 132. I remember the first time I played this late quartet for Abbey on the rim of Escalante Canyon in 1971s. I let my mind go, wallowing in the memories like a warthog in mud. I found my stash of dried yellow chanterelle mushrooms which I had picked in grizzly country, mostly Yellowstone, during the past three autumns. The association of wild mushrooms with grizzly bears for me was unmistakable. The other dried mushrooms, a smaller bag of big white chanterelles had been picked with Peter Matheson below the Grizzly Hilton, a range of hills that I vid visited every year near Glacier National Park in Montana. Of the 10, or 15 people I had taken to the Grizzly Hilton over the past 15 years. The only person to make the trip without seeing a Grizzly was Edward Abbey. Ed went to his death without ever spotting one. He called my favorite animal, the alleged Grizzly. <laughs> Peter saw 25 in one day. Okay. Contrasted with other dried mushrooms such as morels or boletus, the shantel <laughs> and Grizzly didn't reconstitute well. One approach to a surplus of dried chanter, pulver, pulverize them in a food process. This is what I intended, you know, and you like sprinkle on it like salt. I poured another glass of Bordeaux and punched the button. The harsh wine and metallic grain in the processor clashed with the string quartet and abraded my nerve. And after a minute, I turned it off. I dumped a dried and chopped up mushroom into a big stone matate used by the ancient Hohokam 800 years ago. My children, Laurel and Colin, and Ed's two youngest, Rebecca and Ben, found it three miles from our house. In the Matate was a basaltic mono or grinding stone from the same site. I used the grinding stone to pulverize the dried mushroom in the chantel, chan, chanterelle powder and tossed the brown pieces of slow elk in a mixture of flour and ground mushroom. Meanwhile, I preheated the oven and chopped up a dozen heads of garlic. I tossed, I like garlic. A uh, dozen heads, a dozen heads. <laughs> Note in your recipe, people. Yeah. Not cloves, heads. Okay. Not, not cloves, a dozen heads. Now I needed more cooking wine, so I opened another bottle of Chateau Lynch Bodges, thinking this was more than I could easily afford I had two young children and made less than 15 grand a year. After three glasses, I poured the entire remaining contents of the Bordeaux over the works. The level of wine in stock was a bit low, so I opened a big Zinfandel and poured it in, bringing the level of wine up, to, up until it barely covered the slow elk. I turned down the oven and took a break outside, watching the high clouds prepare for sunset and finished my wine. There we go. Okay. <laughs> friends, friends and neighbors and readers. You heard it from him. Live big and care about the world. Life is short. Truly. Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have your message right, Doug? Yeah, I've lived a lot longer than I expected to and you know it's i've already lived ed by 15 years or more 
and it is a gift. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not concerned with my own passing much, but, uh, you know, we all need to fight the battle for, you know, the earth is in trouble right now. And we, we have to be able to commit ourselves in any way you feel you can personally make a difference to fighting the, uh, the dire threats to our planet. Come on, 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 come on. Hey, hey, Doug. Somebody wants to say hi. Hi, sweetheart. Hi, hi, hi. I want to oh. know, was it worth it? Was yeah, it worth yeah, I think it was. It's, yeah. it's, it's answered on the last page. It's answered on the last page. Yeah. Doug, will you read that? Read it. Read it. You want me to read the end of the book? Read, yeah. the, read the end. Read the end. Answer read Betsy's that. question. Answer Betsy's question. What was the question? Was oh. it worth it? Title. Yeah. Was it I worth missed, it? I missed, how did I miss that? Read, read, <laughs> read, read the last couple of paragraphs. Yes. Yes, my friend. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Start with the... That which evolves does not persist without the conditions of its genesis is a sentence I found myself repeating monotonously throughout the decades. When I first wrote that line in a Glacier National Park fire lookout in the 1970s, I was thinking about habitat, especially grizzly bear and human habitat, which I considered the same, mingled fates of humans and bears. For the first 300,000 years of our time on earth, human intelligence, the homo sapien, was carved in habitats whose remnants today we would call the wilderness. Only in the past 15,000 years have we modified that wilderness. First, with the extinction of the great late Pleistocene megafauna, and then with the rise of agriculture from multiple origins around the globe in the last 10,000 years. For over 95% of our time on earth, human evolution, organic intellectual evolution was honed in that pre-agricultural landscape, owing little or nothing to our time in farms or in cities. That relationship is something I don't wanna gamble on. The fight to preserve wilderness is still primary. The late Pleistocene megafauna extinction in North America was a result of climate change which, which pales in comparison to today's global warming. Uh, combined with human activity, namely over hunting about 14 to 16,000 years ago. It's the same deadly duo, duo threatening us today. Climate change and the destructive lie of endless economic growth on a planet with finite resources. Doug, let, let me ask you to hammer this home can you jump forward to the paragraph that starts, there's plenty of work? Because I really want these people to hear this, these last two pages. Okay, let me, let me, uh, let me. Page 302. 302, page, top of page 302. Okay, that's fine. Start, gonna... start with that and just hammer home those last two pages. Okay, here's a question that, um, I, I, I pose, when, in, when it is indeed our time to walk, to walk off stage with the mammoths, what might, I'm sorry, I'm all, uh, what might be the measure of our character at the end of our tour? After peering into the, after peering into the abyss, how do we behave? There is great joy in doing the toll of the world, fighting for wild causes, and saving pieces of the magnificent natural world. There's plenty of work. Do your job with decency and an open heart. Love your brothers and sisters in all actions and all relationships. Speak the truth. Extend your innate empathy to distant tribes and strange animals. Arm yourself with front friendship and love the earth. Remember your elders. Walt Whitman said, resist much. Obey, obey little, or as Ed Abbey noted, a patriot must always be ready to defend his country against his government. Hold nothing back. Join the tribes in their dignified defense of native rights. 
An indigenous viewpoint should replace all notions of Western wildlife management. Respect to this militant resistance embrace the necessity of civil disobedience. What's right and not is legal and vice versa. Consider getting arrested. Who and what is at risk? If past extinctions provide guidelines, then it's all life larger than a small meadow mouse. Now I can unpleasantly anticipate being among those minority humans left on earth to die from old age. I'd be happier if everyone could. It's a scourge my geezerhood. I am unconcerned with my own death and fatally engaged in the lives of all my survivors. There, there's a bottomless contradictory sadness and a fleeting glimpse of justice. Nature bats last, avenging the scorched earth, payback to homo sapiens, bundled up in the loss of beauty and suffering in the lives of the people you love most. But then I watched the glacier grizzly walking slowly through a herd of elk that paid, no, paid him no mind nor got out of his way. And that other grizzly, the nursery cub next to my daughter, Laurel and me, or one winter finding a roost of eight long eared owls perched in a desert oak tree. And my pleasure when the owls returned to the same tree the next year. Seeing an old photo of my father with my two and four year old children soaking in one on a warm creek in Yellowstone, the swell of love and loss. We visited Ed Abbey in the spring, the trace of the growler washed with a ribbon of gold from the globe mallows seeded by winter rains. Later, Rick Ridgway and I drove through a field of person high red mallow in the same landscape with clouds, beautiful butterflies magically boiling out of the thickets. Coming over a huge dune on an amphibious skeleton coast with Andrea and my son Colin, we stumbled across a hidden lake settled below the swallowing sand dunes. Hundreds of pink, pink flamingos shifting in an oasis, high stepping ballot of color. Back on the mesas above Arizona's Aravipa Creek, my cowboy year, Riding my sturdy horse hook with my loyal collie, Larry, by my side, startling herds of dozens of mule deer and javelina every few miles, running into, running into 100 hooved animals on an average day. Much later, Dennis Sizemore, nervously guiding our bush vehicle through a maternal herd of aggressive, protective elephants somewhere in the Okabondo Delta hiking with Terry Tempest Williams up Mill Creek in Newton, finding a green painted cocapelli hidden in a recess. At sunset with Edge Gage and the Bosque de la Pache on the Rio Grande, we, we squatted in the cattails while hundreds of red winged blackbirds slammed into the bulrushes at eyeball level. My son Colin and I abandoned in Northwest Nibia with a safari vehicle in a rhino preserve Finding our water in Tanaha, it's the same as in our own desert. Sleeping in a tent, faces out, faces towards the rear, so a lion wouldn't drag us out in the bush, or a hyena wouldn't bite her face, <coughs> wouldn't bite her faces off. It was an outer Africa type camp, and we started our evening meal in the mid-afternoon. A porky pot, a three-legged Dutch oven, a vessel we fired with acacia chips, covering the gems box shank, onion and garlic with lots of cheap South African red wine. Then climbing to the pass towards an unmapped trailless valley. At the pass, the ground was ripped apart from rhino pine. Out of the nearby towering acacia treetops rose nine geographic heads. We went nine giraffe heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, giraffe, nine giraffe heads. Yeah, they were, they were great. We went no further, turning back towards our dinner. Once taking Doug Seuss to the Grizzly Hilton and the two of us watching a circle of friends tightly gather around the small water hole, four swaying adult mother grizzlies, four bear cubs, a yearling and two sub-adult grizzlies, a prior litter of one of the moms. Science doesn't admit the spectrum of behavior. The bears were dancing. It was worth it. There's your answer, friends. What's that? 
<laughs> There's the answer. It was worth it. Was it worth it? Betsy asked. There's the answer. Um, I do have a couple of great questions from the audience if you guys are up for it. Yes, we'll do our best. All right. Um, we have an, uh, an anonymous attendee says, Doug said, in another setting, war wounds or PTSD can be made into an offensive weapon for the positive. The, ask, the questioner is curious, what clicked? What turned the wounds to the positive weapon for you? Well, I was, I was inclined towards uh, wilderness and I also preferred dangerous animals. And I knew that was, uh, that was a consequence of, uh, of war sickness. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, you know, I, uh, I immediately, almost immediately recognized the power of these animals over human thinking. And uh, to do that, I think you really need to in, in, involve yourselves with them, immerse yourself deeply with the grizzly bear and do your best to even see, you know, try to penetrate the inner life of a grizzly. And they're much more social and communicative than we'd ever give them credit for. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the window into their life is humans behaving uh, inoffensively around their youngsters. That's about it. That's that, you know, I would take care of 90% of the injuries grizzly bears afford to human beings is, you know, they, they act incorrectly when they encounter a mother with, with cubs or yearlings. And, uh, you know, I've done that 30 or 30 some times and, uh, you know, no bears ever touched me, but the outcome can be unexpected. Like the mother grizzly, my daughter and I saw on a, in a windstorm on a small butte in Yellowstone, we were huddled behind a, a glacier erratic and a, and a mother grizzly with a yearling just popped up, you know, it's, we're trying to see over the next hill and she's not very far away. She's about 70 feet, I guess. And she saw us, we saw her at the same time. And she, you know, reared and went through her full spectrum of uh, grizzly deciding what it's gonna do, you know, behavior with just slobbering and standing and stuff like that. And, and I just said to my daughter, don't move. You know, and uh, we didn't. And the bear walked over the rise and walked right past us. And I mean, close, like 15, 20 feet and went to the edge of the cliff, which is where mother grizzlies often take their young during the mating season of grizzlies, which tends to be early June and nursed their cub in front of us um, about seven minutes. It was, uh, you know, that has only happened to me in Alaska, in British Columbia, along salmon streams, where that behavior has been recorded. You know, Mother, um, Mother Grizzly uh, up in the Nakanaw River um, in British Columbia uh, brought her three cubs over to me, left them sitting right next to me on the bank of this river, went on, got a salmon, and came back and collected her cubs and went on. Now, this uh, behavior, which has been recorded like at uh, Larry Allmiller up on the uh, McNeil River, you know, it's, it's not commonplace, but it happens all the time. The mother grizzlies leave their cubs with people because uh, the theory is, and I, I accept it, that, uh, you know, mother grizzlies want to avoid male grizzlies above all, and the great grizz, male grizzlies avoid us. So that, that happens. Um, but the question was uh, about the war. Yeah, and um, how you turned that trauma and those war wounds and the PTSD into a positive weapon. Yeah, well, I was never sure it wasn't an opportunity for action myself, so I never considered it. You know, and, those, and also you just, uh, there's some wounds you'll never heal from, and that's fine. You have to fold them into your, you know, cosmic view of the earth and, 
th that's okay too. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I recognize that uh, the great bear was, you know, the great externalizer of the great wilderness and uh, wounded people of all types from all causes, you know, could use getting out of themselves to try to see back in, you know, the, the quickest exit from, from culture, in my opinion, is a trip to the wilderness. But grizzly bears really help it because, you know, you, you are faced with something that, uh, you know, should it choose, can kill and eat you. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bad rumor. David and I, Todd, all written about it. But, uh, you know, it's <laughs> the one animal, as David has really exquisitely stated, that uh, chooses uh, to intimidate the most arrogant species on earth, homo sapiens, of the proper place on the planet. And, you know, I, I believe that fully. And to remind uh, us that we're just another flavor of meat. Oh, that's such a great phrase. I think I stole it in this book a little bit. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another flavor of meat. That's so great. Excellent. Um, I've got a question here uh, from Ryan Busey or Bussy, uh, Doug, Ryan Bussy here. In Walking It Off, you write of the idea of being forced to exist in and propagate a system in which you do not believe. And here we are. What is your, your advice for fighting from within or from without those systems? Uh, Ryan, that's a, that's a great one. And it pins, pins me down all the way because that's, it, that's what I try to do every day. And uh, we got dogs, sorry, man. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very anti-war, but I, 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 uh, I fought in war. There are coyotes that, in, in the streets and javelina bouncing around, you know. Where are the dogs? Where are the dogs? Come on, bring the dogs. Bring all the dogs. Bring the dogs. <laughs> okay, man, we'll have a party. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a great, the great quandary of my life. Um, we have to use all our experience, all our histories, and all our intelligence to, to to try to nudge the planet in less destructive ways. I think the biggest thing of all, of course, is climate change, which is a blanket over everything. But I mean, just in the last couple of days, we've got the rattle of a nuclear war, you know, shaking. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I think we should, you know, write and talk to people and comment and uh, try that approach just in the short run. Because Ryan wrote this incredibly effective book on uh, the gun, gun industry. It's really an incredible book. Um, so I'm gonna keep pushing that stone up the mountain, Ryan. I'm just, uh, I don't, I don't uh, have what's, any... what's, what's the title of that book by Ryan? Betsy has talked to me about that too. Gunfight. Gunfight. Yeah. Ryan also talked with us here at Country Bookshelf about it. Um, so you can find that on our YouTube channel. You put it on. Um... <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on my list if you'll put it on your list. Todd, will you put it on your list? We've already reviewed it at Mountain Journal. God, you're oh, way ahead God, of me. You're always man. ahead of us, man. You're always <laughs> ahead. You're always three steps ahead. All right, I'm putting it on my list tonight. It's been Betsy's talked to me about Ryan gunfight. Mm -hmm. Get it. Read it. Um, kind of along the same veins here. Uh, Amy says, "I'm glad to hear about the arrowheads." These days, I wonder about what my responsibility to indigenous people is when I go out adventuring in the wilderness. It doesn't feel like it's enough to just acknowledge historical ownership. Do you think about this when you go out into national parks, parks or forests or BLM land? 
any thoughts about what we can do or what can be done by Anglos who love land that is only accessible to us through such violence? That's a great comment. And I agree completely. You know, my, my gesture of reburying the arrowheads is a notion of repatriation. Um, and, uh, you know, everywhere I go, I value and see these landscapes because I've thought about indigenous people all my life. Every time I look for an arrowhead as a little boy, I try to imagine how these people lived in such places, you know, fishing, hunting, gathering, and all the land, you know, the hell with national parks and BLM land. I mean, you know, their land was the original wilderness, which no one owns, no one. And that's the beauty of it. And that's why I'll fight for that forever. And uh, uh, everybody that's appropriated indigenous land, and most of us have, because there, was, there are people all over the place, need to keep that, not just acknowledge, but keep it in the back of our mind. If there's any gesture of, uh, of repatriation, we should take advantage of it. It's, uh, and it was, you know, wilderness is a, it's not a great accepted term anymore, but, you know, the closest approximation is, you know, what the indigenous people uh, um, hunted and gathered over for 13,000 years. And they didn't substantially change the ecosystems. I mean, I know some archaeologists and anthropologists will quibble, but I don't think they did. Um, scale, a matter of scale. Yeah. There, there's a lovely quote from one of my favorite indigenous authors behind me here uh, from Braiding Sweetgrass, from Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, I just have too much glare, too much light. Uh, it's a terrible problem to have. But we're also here at Country Bookshelf, at least, looking forward to having a broader conversation um, about intersectional environmentalism, and, because climate change is such a huge impact on non-white communities, both systemically and um, they're often the voices that don't get heard when we are talking about protecting these places. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, it'll get us all it's an equal opportunity predator. <laughs> yes uh, quick question for David uh, pray tell what is the Quammen drink is the Quammen Eduardo drink? wants to be badly influenced like the other cool kids um, a, a dry martini with good London dry gin <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we have a couple of viewers who are curious, Doug, um, what your thoughts are on the recent wolf issues, um, particularly kind of contrasting. It looks like a couple of people are contrasting what's going on in Montana with what's going on in Colorado. Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts. I used to say arrogantly that the only thing that could make Montana game management look good was Wyoming. Well, that's no longer the case. And, you know, I'm glad Colorado is holding out some hope for wolves. What we and our neighboring Rocky Mountain states are doing, trying to do is just, is, it'll be un unforgivable in the uh, legends of history because, um, and the only way to really protect the wolves is get them back on the endangered species list in some kind of designation, you know, just because they reproduce well, um, they can't be killed in these numbers. Um, and we just, uh, it, cows are a problem everywhere, you know, a lot of things like to eat them. And, and we have enough money to pay for the cows. Why, why can't the, uh, why can't the states just leave it at that? Uh, document and pay them off. But um, I, it, this is this is a, this is a hate crime against wolves. It is a hate crime. You know, it's based on a all near racist theory. 
And it's just, uh, it's so disgusting to see these people who fear the unknown, you know, so much. And much of the unknown that we fear, we hate. And uh, this is what results. And it's deep. And I don't know where it comes from because it doesn't, you know, I, I can't extract it from my own brain stem. But, uh, you know, uh, Europeans who really haven't adapted much to America maintain this kind of dominion over the animals. And it's, it's, it's a deep sickness. I wish indigenous uh, philosophy would underlie all game management. You know, you need to respect the animals as brothers, sisters, and... Uh, no, this is it's, it's tragic. Treatment of the wolves. Tragic. Yes. Thank you. Well, I think our final question, as um, several p- folks in the chat have said they want to grow up to be Doug. Um, some folks said it was too late for some other folks. And it's, it's never too late. Uh, <laughs> there are bumps in the road. <laughs> uh, um, never grown up. But, yeah. Good just got older. <laughs> um, how do we cultivate a new generation of dogs? How, how, do, we, how do we grow more um, conservationists? Jessica, can I add a variant of that question? Yes. Which I think is, it's to me really important. I think it's really important. Doug, how do you tell Olivia, your granddaughter, and others, that it's important to hope and that it's impossible, that it, excuse me, that it's important to hope and that it is possible to hope. How do you tell them that it's worth it to keep fighting, that there is hope? Well, it's a tough one, but uh, that's what I strive to do every day is, uh, you know, I don't think a semantic redefinition of, of hope, uh, it will solve all our problems, but uh, uh, optimism, you know, um, it's, it's really difficult to look at the naked truth of today's world and, uh, and, and find hope and transfer that to, you know, to your children or grandchildren. But I, uh, you know, I I just believe in the value of fighting every day for every wild cause you can, you know, and writing, all our writings are serving this purpose. They're really important. Todd and David, you know, they're just so important. David's one of the most, he, you know, he's the most, dazzling brilliant science writer working today <laughs> there's not much science in that david <laughs> you know just of, kind of impressions a, i'd say there's a lot of there's a lot of wild country there's a lot of beautiful beautiful truly voice truly and passion yeah, yeah. indeed there's so much um I'm seeing a couple of comments go by. Uh, Todd, do you want to tell us how we can support uh, Mountain Journal? Uh, read Mountain Journal. Uh, we would love to expand. I mean, if we had a budget, I would hire Quammen and Peacock as our roving correspondents. But you can find Mountain Journal at mountainjournal.org and um, help us spread the word. Amazing. David, is there anything in your horizon that you can share with us? Well, there's this coronavirus. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, you heard about that? Yeah. So I've written a book about that in the last year and a half, and it'll come out in October. Amazing. Um, Until then, everyone, be sure to grab your copy of Was It Worth It? Um, There's links in the chat. 
Uh, I'm going to go package everyone who purchased their copy. I'm going to go put those in envelopes right now. Um, I want to thank all three of you so much for such a wonderful, heartfelt, thoughtful conversation. It's been so wonderful to share this space with you all tonight. And hopefully someday we can share it in person. We love you, Peacock. Yeah, I love you too, Todd. We love you, we love love you Dougie. Well, we love God you, Dougie. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you, Jessica. Good thank night. you, <laughs> Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thanks for coming in. Good night, everybody.